welcome everyone to the 2022 fall sessions of the CCIR Academy information session. My name is Oliver. I work mostly in the areas of outreach and communications. And the main goal of today's uh, info session is to give you guys a better understanding of some of the opportunities on offer here at CCIR. Um, so just before we get started, uh, I want to do a quick review of the agenda today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about us as a whole as an organization. Um, we're going to go from there and dive right into what we do here at the CCIR Academy, which is where both our programs are located. Um, and then I'll dive into the sort of nitty gritty. Thing. So uh, to begin, a quick note about who we are. So, so CCR was founded by a group of Cambridge graduates, including myself, um, and our overall commitment is to make academic research more accessible to the public. We work with early career researchers and leading academics, uh, and the overarching goal of our work is to build bridges between academia and the wider public. To this end, we have two basic arms of our operations, the CCR Think Tank and the CCR Academy. The Academy is what we'll talk about most today, but also give you guys a glimpse of what we do over at the Think Tank. Over at the Think Tank, our main focus is in empowering researchers and disseminating knowledge. So every year we nominate CCR fellows. This year we have Dr. Brian Earp from Oxford, the Bioethics Institute there, and also um, I'm blanking on his name, but a, another researcher from the University of Adelaide who's working on the philosophy of education and the philosophy of law. Um, so what we do with them is create various kinds of public outreach and public knowledge projects. So in the one case, we created a video essay series, in the other, a ongoing podcast series. Um, the overarching goal here is to provide these platforms and provide financial support for faculty who are interested in doing public intellectual work. Um, in this realm, we also do all sorts of other things like public lectures for high schools, uh, policy thons, essay competitions, podcasts, and so on and so forth. Um, what you guys are here mostly for today is the CCR Academy, um, our two programs, the Future Scholar and the One-on-One. -on -One. And here the main aim is to provide gifted students like yourself to conduct systematic and rigorous independent research online with leading academics and industry experts around the world. So um, let's turn now to the CCR Academy. So, at the CCR Academy, what we focus on is this idea of research and of teaching students how to do it and why research is valuable. So before we dive right into the programs, um, we should talk a little bit about what research is and what the value of research is for students like yourselves. Um, when we think about research, especially at CCIR, we really like to think of it primarily as a mode of learning and a mode of teaching, a kind of pedagogical concept, if you will. Um, the basic idea here is that we want our students to break away from what we conceive to be the more traditional model of teaching and learning, which you find in places like most high schools and even at the university level in most lectures. The basic distinction here is between a traditional model of a consumer of knowledge, um, where um, the student is really just in a position of receiving that knowledge, and the whole structure is where the knowledge is being transmitted and where uh, the success of transmission is being checked up through mechanisms like examinations. What we're trying to do here at CCR is reverse that relationship and make our students the true agents and creators of knowledge. The basic idea here is that we want our students to be the ones that are uh, thinking about what projects are interesting to them, actively choosing and creating the entire educational experience for themselves. Um, this allows students to really choose to pursue their passions, to dive deep and study what they love. Uh, the overarching goal here then is to teach students what research is, how to do research, and give them the tools, the platforms, and the support that allows them to really dive deep in a particular field of their interest. Within this context, mentorship is extremely, extremely important. Um, this is because our mentors are no longer teachers in the traditional sense of people who simply transmit knowledge. They're truly exemplars and mentors who provide guidance and inspiration to all our students. Um, in a second, I'll also talk a little bit about some of the more practical utilitarian benefits of um, doing a research project, especially at the high school level. Um, 
if there are undergraduates in the audience, um, I think the practical utilitarian benefits of doing research at that level are really, really clear. Um, especially you're looking to grad school, looking to uh, the job market in positions like consulting or even in finance and law and things like that. Um, having research skills and the ability to conduct research, pull through a project is really, really invaluable. Um, so at the Academy, as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is really provide this um, rigorous, systematic, intensive uh, academic experience for our students. Um, thus, we work with leading faculty from around the world, and thus we provide the kind of tools and support that allow our students to go further than simply doing the program and participate in the wider academic community through things like conferences and publications. So all of this I'll expand on in just a minute. So uh, when we say that our mentors uh, come from exceptional universities and from the best schools around the world, we, what we mean is that they come exclusively from these universities, everywhere from Harvard and, um, Harvard and Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge, where we originally got started. Um, for us, it's extremely, extremely important that our students um, that our students learning experience don't simply stop with let's say the 13 weeks of the future scholar or the 14 sessions of the one-on-one -on -one. we want our students to really be engaged in the wider community uh, wider academic community and the main way in which we do this is by supporting them through uh, publication when we talk about publication we're mostly thinking about things like undergraduate conferences, journals, and workshops, um, especially at the high school level. If you're an undergrad, we'd be shooting more at the graduate level. Um, even at this level, it's extremely challenging, extremely competitive to get published. Um, that being said, um, what we, as an overarching aim, try to do is help our students publish at these very prestigious but very legitimate channels. So as you guys might be aware, if you guys have looked around on the internet at some other programs, um, there are some programs out there that will guarantee you publication. Um, I should note that the only way you can possibly do that is by working with what are known as predatory journals. Predatory journals are pay to play venues where if you pay a sum of money, you can simply publish there, uh, no matter the quality of your paper. Um, by contrast, what we try to do is what we have done is build up a database of legitimate and prestigious undergraduate, graduate, and even professional level journals that our students, uh, knowing our students that they have a chance at publishing at. In the past year, our students have been accepted to everywhere from the IE, MIT Re Undergraduate Research and Technology Conference um, to the, um, the ICCB workshop for on, on AI, which is both really excellent conferences. Dartmouth Undergraduate Journal of Science, we had students publishing uh, work in computational genetics in there. Um, regardless, our students do really, really well. And this is in large part because of the kinds of support and, um, and, and help we provide our students. Um, so the way that we provide a publication support to our students is by uh, having well someone on the team who is dedicated specifically to this task. Uh, following the progress of each and every student, understanding what their publication aims are throughout the program, tracking this progress, giving them advice, letting their faculty know what kinds of conferences they're shooting for and what kinds of work that they should be doing in order to get there. Um, this week, uh, this work extends throughout the program and even into the post-program dates. Now, we can briefly circle back to the question of practical and utilitarian advantages of doing a research project, especially at the high school level. So I was having a conversation just, um, I think, two months ago with uh, with one of our, uh, with, with a close friend who's an independent education consultant. Um, and she had described to me the 2021 admission cycles as being a quote unquote bloodbath. And her basic explanation was that the rise of test optional admissions has generated a fundamental shift in US undergraduate admissions. Traditionally, the SAT and ACT has been one of the strongest indicators of academic excellence and academic strength. 
as soon as schools went test optional, students needed other ways of expressing their intellectual and academic strength. The question now thus becomes beyond my GPA, what else can I do to showcase my academic excellence? Within this context, CCR offers a fairly interesting um, and extremely beneficial um, opportunity for students. Um, through our program, which is extremely, uh, for the Future Scholar, very intimate, five uh, class sizes that are capped at five, where you have a TA and a uh, professor. For the one-on-one -on -one mentorship, obviously one-on-one -on -one interactions. These intimate, uh, closely knit structures are really ultimately conducive to extremely, extremely personalized letters of references from leading academics from around the world. I should note here that CCR does not guarantee letters of references from your faculty because to do so would be unethical. However, because we have such a rigorous admission system, because we have such strong students, and um, because of the way in which we structure our courses, the students uh, who do request letters of references typically do get them and get really good ones. The second way in which uh, our programs do help with admissions is definitely through the research and publication program. Um, this is a program that extends to every student through both programs and the students that do manage to get published and uh, get into conferences, workshops, and journals um, really do add a big bright star on their CVs. So um, we, we have seen a really, really quite dramatic um, uh, round of statistics, especially for the past uh, two years of admissions of CCR alumni. Um, we just recently gathered this data. Uh, the data was based off of the self-reporting of students and um, quite a lot of work on our end, tracking down LinkedIn's Facebook pages of past students. Um, after looking over hundreds of past students' uh, profiles, ultimately what we gathered was that the data says that over 42.9% of our U.S. applying uh, alumni went to top 10 U.S. universities, which is honestly a staggering statistic. We were even shocked when we found this ourselves. 80% um, of them go to top 30, 91.4 uh, top 50. When we looked at the QS, um, um, QS admissions rankings, uh, world university rankings, 32.2% of all our alumni went to top 10 U.S. Uh, top 10 QS universities. So while we can't take complete credit for our students' success, um, our students come in extremely strong with very strong grades and um, extremely strong profiles. Um, we do think CCR has played an essential role in helping them push them that much further to get them into these excellent, excellent institutions. Okay, so that's about it for uh, the academy at a general level. Let's now dive into the nitty gritties of the programs and how they work. So the Future Scholar Program is our group program that we run three times a year, uh, once in the spring, once in the summer, and once in the fall. The upcoming session is in uh, has its admissions deadline for October 15th, and um, we will be running these courses starting from late October. The, our overarching goal of these courses is to design courses that are challenging, interesting, um, and well-structured for students to have the support that they need to pursue subjects that are of their interest. Now, the way that uh, each of these courses work, um, each session we offer anywhere between 40 to 50 different courses, but every course is structured essentially in the same way. Each course is composed of 13 weeks, um, and uh, each course has a cohort of anywhere between two to five students. These two to five students will be paired with a faculty mentor and a PhD student TA from one of the aforementioned universities. Uh, each week, students will meet once with their professor and once with their TA, and over the course of 13 weeks, the ultimate goal here is to help the students work on one final project. This one final project is a, intended to be a big project that they slowly, slowly build up to. Um, the way that we've structured the course then is to have a foundational teaching uh, component to the course and then a practical research component of the course where the course is essentially broken down into a 50-50 structure. 
The first 50% of the course is going to be teaching focus. Each week, you'll be receiving lectures from your mentor. You'll, uh, you'll have discussion sessions with your TA. If you're doing something with coding or with practical elements, your TA will help you with that. As you build up these skills and this basis of knowledge, there will be a transitional period where you'll be doing project proposals, research and methodology sessions. And towards the second half of the program, you'll really start getting to work on your project. The course will transition then from being more teaching focused to more workshop focused. Students will give presentations. They will receive additional lectures based off of student interests. Um, and everything in the second half of the program will be specifically tailored to the projects that each and every student through these courses are doing. In the fall, we're offering not 34, I do need to change that. It's, I believe, 40 something courses um, in everything from developmental uh, biology to metabolomics to computational genetics to data science to startup financing to natural language processing to medical ethics to, um, to rhetoric to um, international relations. Um, I won't dwell too much on these courses here. You guys can take a quick look right now. Uh, what I would recommend you guys do instead is go on the website and download the full prospectus. There you can find detailed breakdowns of each and every course, what they're about, um, who's teaching it, detailed biographies of each and every mentor. Um, there's just far too many courses for me to get through uh, in this meeting. Um, so I do encourage you guys to take a look at the brochure. Um, let's talk a bit about omissions then. As I mentioned, the deadline, uh, the regular deadline is for the 15th. The early deadline is for the 1st. We, uh, we admit students, uh, on a two round basis. So we, um, we will review all the early admissions candidates first in October 1st and, um, and process those admissions. Um, and then we'll look at the uh, regular admissions post um, post early admissions. Um, this means that the early admission students do have a definite early bird advantage, especially for some of the popular courses, which are a lot of the STEM courses, I would say. Um, there's a definite early bird advantage because of the small class sizes, because of the competitive admissions. Now, the application process itself is fairly simple. Um, you fill out our application, you send us your transcript and any supplementary materials that you believe can help showcase you. This includes everything from standardized testing, writing samples, CVs, and certificates, all of which are optional and truly optional. However, if you do have writing samples that are relevant to the field you're applying for, if you do have a CV especially, we strongly encourage you to send it. Um, the CV especially helps us to just get your profile at a glance. Um, the writing sample uh, shows us how you actually do your work. Um, standardized testing, if you have it and you do well, send it to us. Um, otherwise, don't worry about it at all. Um, Qualified applicants who have passed the paper, uh, the on-paper review will then be invited to an interview. The interview is typically conducted nowadays mostly by the TAs. And the overarching aim here is to talk, uh, get a sense of your background and your problem solving skills, but also just to have a conversation with you about what your passions and aspirations are with regard to this specific subject and why you're applying to this program. Um, I would say the interview shouldn't be something you stress out too much about. Um, come to it prepared to talk about uh, what you're interested in and why you're interested in and, and, and the subjects and topics within that field that you're passionate about. Ultimately, all our admissions decisions in both programs are made by the decision themselves. So we'll circulate those recordings if they're not done by the professors themselves to the professors and they will rank the top applicants. For the top applicants, they would then receive an offer and then we'll get started right after that. So that about covers the Future Scholar program, turning now to the one-on-one -on -one program. The one-on-one -on -one research program is our tailor-made individualized uh, program where one student works with one mentor on one project. Um, the, big, um, the big selling point of this program is definitely its flexibility and its customizability. Um, this, uh, this flexibility is um, showcased in two basic dimensions. You have the flexibility of its content and the flexibility of its structure. What this means is that if you're interested in something fairly specific, um, 
let's say you're interested in atmospheric sciences, which is not something that we offer through the Future Scholar Program. However, we do have someone who works specifically in that, in atmospheric chem chemistry, um, and does sort of data science computational work on that. Um, if that happens to be your interest, we can pair you directly with them. Um, the way that this program works, the reason why we're able to customize the content down to such a fine level of specificity is because we work with beyond the 40 some faculty at the Future Scholar program, 150 faculty at the one on one program. Uh, these are all faculty from the same universities, as mentioned before, that cover everything from 13th century monastic history to topological physics. Um, so the way that this program works is you come to us, tell us what your interests are. It could be general, it could be specific, and then we work with you and try to create the most perfect one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship experience for you. Additionally, beyond the customizability of the content, this program is also customizable um, in virtue of its structure. So. Uh, rather than give you that 13 week, two times a week structure here, we offer you 14 one hour sessions that you can structure according to your needs. Most students choose to do these 14 sessions over 14 weeks, but you can do them over 10, you can do them over 20, you can do them over 28 if you want. Um, typically, we wouldn't recommend the 28 week schedule just because it's way too long, um, but a, a 20 week schedule, very, very common. Um, with this program, it's also start date flexible. So whereas the Future Scholar program has those three set terms each year, for the one-on-one -on -one program, you can really start it whenever you get admitted. Um, this is really what we mean by um, the one-on-one -on -one program allowing you to study what you want in the way that you want. So this is just a quick uh, overview of some of the past student projects that our students have worked on, um, just mostly in terms of research areas. I won't dwell on this. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, so it could be, uh, yeah. But let's focus then on admissions. Admissions is very similar to the Future Scholar Program with a few small differences. For the one-on-one -on -one program, we do require each and every student who's applying to this program to first schedule what we call an intake meeting with us. Through the intake meeting, um, what we're trying to do is two things. One is to give you a slightly better understanding of what your uh, options are in terms of customizability in the program. Two, it's to um, check if this program is the best one for you. Oftentimes, some students are better for the future scholar, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences between them and the pros and cons of each in a second. Three, by having the intake meeting, we're get to, we get to meet you um, and kick off the course design process at the earliest possible stage for you. This gives us more information to figure out who's your best men, uh, who's the best mentor for you, what courses, uh, what subjects are suitable, and how we should be designing your course given your needs and your aspirations. Um, the subsequent steps are quite similar. Uh, you submit your application and your materials. Uh, qualified applicants will be invited to an interview. The interview is uh, fairly similar to the other um, uh, to the Future Scholar Program. And then what we then do is create a profile for you by bundling up your interview recording and your, all your application materials. We do a little write up for you, and we circulate that with relevant faculty members. Um, if you're interested in something like uh, behavioral economics, we'll circulate that information to every behavioral economic economist that we work with. Um, once we get an indication of interest from one of the faculty members, we'll revert it back to you and, and set up an introductory meeting between you and your mentor. The aim of this final meeting is for both of you to confirm that you'd be happy to work with each other and that the project and expectations of this program are feasible and realistic and while being challenging and interesting. Um, and so this will largely be a conversation about your background and your aspirations, but also your expectations, objectives, and aims with the program. After the meeting is done, we'll double check with everyone that uh, we're happy to move forward and um, you'll get an offer and we'll move on from there. Um, so this is just a quick glimpse of our admissions in the past, uh, in, in the summer. Um, our average incoming GPA was 3.9, average SAT was 1516. I should note that with the average SAT, um, the because of our test optional nature, it could be a little bit inflated, but uh, the average GPA uh, speaks for itself. It's extremely high. 
uh, but don't let the statistics scare you. Um, what we're looking for ultimately are students who will thrive in our programs. And if you're a student with a lower average GPA uh, applying, let's say, to the behavioral neuroscience course, and we see that you have excellent psychology grades, excellent biology grades, um, a keen interest outside of school in the topic, but just terrible, terrible history grades. Um, we really wouldn't care about the history grades. Um, we're just looking for students who will do well in the course, and that might be you despite your a lower average GPA. Um, taking, look at, uh, taking a look on the right, uh, you'll see that the average um, admissions rate for both programs is fairly similar. I should note that I personally actually think this um, admissions uh, statistics is not particularly useful because the admissions um, statistics do vary quite a bit across the courses. Um, in general, STEM is a bit more popular, a bit more hard to get into. Um, I would say for the summer program, some of the courses was, were running at sort of a 10 to 15 admissions rate, um, whereas for the humanities, it was much more close to a 30 to 40 admissions rate. Uh, keep in mind also that summer admissions is by and far more competitive than spring and fall. So if you guys, um, uh, so that might be good news for you guys as well. Now. Uh, before we get to the, uh, the q and I just want to flag two things here. One is on the right-hand side, another reminder of the admissions deadline. On the left-hand side, at the bottom there, you can find my email, which you can use to reach me um, if uh, you have any further questions beyond this Q&A session. 